In the Volkswagen car factory at Wolfsburg in Germany, they turn out 3,000 Golfs a day. One complete car every 15 seconds. There's no disputing the success of the Volkswagen product. Cars and vans which will be driven on roads all over the world. But in the early 1990s, like so many other manufacturing industries, the car makers were facing change. As we've been successful, I think the feeling was the product had made us successful. So in, in essence, I think there was a feeling, whether it was admitted or not, that the car itself had uh, made us successful. Uh, looking forward, certainly from the uh, managing director's point of view, uh, it was going to be a, a tough time ahead, and it so proved with the recession and the uh, car market being unstabilized. And uh, we took that action 18 months before that happened. And they say, well, that's gratuitous. But that action was really to look at the people. It was going to be the people in the future, the service aspects, that was going to contribute to the product. And there have been some influences in Japan, uh, in America, the Japanese in America. What sold the product became not so much uh, the product itself because most cars look the same and are getting a better quality. Um, uh, what was going to make the difference was actually the people, the service aspects. So uh, then started uh, embarking on looking at the people and how we develop the people, how we develop the people for the future. And, uh, uh, again, when we looked at those, uh, there was a, a degree of complacency about uh, the market share had remained the same, fairly stagnant over the past 10 years. Uh, and uh, from that aspect, we thought, well, we need to bring something different, something new into the organization, something fresh, uh, something we focus the organization. This new strategy for developing people led to a middle manager's training course, and drama teacher Dorothy Hethcote was one ingredient in that something fresh. She's renowned in the world of education, but less familiar in industrial training. Norman Morrison had seen her teaching children years before on a television series which actually looked at industrial change through a drama set in an imaginary shoe factory. If she could make industrial change so believable for 10-year-olds, thought Norman, what could she do for real managers in the real world of international car manufacture and retailing? So when Norman Morrison organized his next professional management course at the Car Companies International Training Center at Haus Roder near Wolfsburg in Germany, he invited Dorothy Hethcote to join his team of trainers. I felt from my previous work, uh, she had uh, always brought a, a different dimension to the standard training techniques. Um, this was different. Uh, we were trying to say to the organization, it is going to be different, this is different, the, the company is different. We cannot live on our past laurels, even though we were successful. Um, and I think, in a sense, uh, Dorothy added that dimension, or I always felt she added that dimension, in, in programs that we're running. Uh, it, this is different, this is, this is something that's it's out of the norm, and yet it's something, I think as one of the other said, makes my brain hurt. And I think that, 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 that is important. For most of the three-week course, the 16 delegates, middle managers from Volkswagen departments all over England, studied the conventional subjects to further their careers. Team building, time management, personal presentation. Every morning and afternoon, they were put through strenuous physical training sessions. And just before lunch every day, they sat down to a lesson with Dorothy Hethcote. During these sessions, she helped them to move away from their real world and become consultants to a fictional firm of tarpaulin manufacturers, a metaphor for Volkswagen itself. The whole point of working like this is that uh, the fiction puts people off guard if they'll go along with it and that is when it frees them 
to develop new ideas and new approaches and different ways of doing things. Because you see, if you approach things directly, as most courses do, I would imagine, uh, the cop in the head takes over. Boyle calls it the cop in the head that says, wait a minute, I don't like things like that. Or, oh, I approve of that guy. He's saying what I think. And that cop in the head filters out the opportunity for breaking into new areas that you can't do in your real life easily because you're in a penalty zone. But in the no penalty zone of the fiction, you can be caught unaware and take yourself by surprise that you thought of something in a way you hadn't quite seen it before because you didn't have to be in that penalty area. And I think there are all sorts of breakthroughs that can happen because it is an agreed fiction. It is not a con. It is an agreed fiction. But let yourself get caught in it because it's true. It's truthful to how life is. And that's the, you know, that seems to me the big, the big key that a lot of people won't use because they find it, uh, it's a play way. Because we've got this false notion of what theatre is. I am asked to record your actual statements so far as I can. I will do my best, but I don't have shorthand. In the last session of this first week, Dorothy Hethcote splits the room into committees of four and invites the delegates to read the brochure of the tarpaulin firm the consultants have been invited to help through a time of change. But first, they note that the brochure looks old-fashioned, steeped in tradition, with outdated marketing concepts. Then, Remembering all they've learnt, she invites them to look again. Now you are to look at it very critically in terms of what successes could we build on? Now that's more subtle than it sounds. What successes do they think they've had we could build on? Or what successes can we perceive could be built on? Now, they're two totally different strategies. So, <clears throat> gentlemen, remember you are consultants. Well, there's two distinct areas here. One, we've got to look at what they think their successes are. What, what, have, what have they done with that? to smack the customer in the face with what they believe their successes are and then what do we perceive some of their successes are that we can build on for them. Well, Tom Bright, that's one very specific area of excellence. Yeah, but is it something that they, they think is, is a major success or is it something that we're saying, hang on a minute, we found this bit in there, we can raise that profile. Well, if at the end of this session, a reporter on each table, Dorothy Hethcote describes them as silent scribes, summarises the discussion. And the person that said it, it made it sound like it would be nonsense and we're not going to go, and everybody agreed with that. Seen differently, and they could think of these same things they criticise the company for as potential strengths. Uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the battleship that, that was uh, used as a symbol of what the company could do could do was now seen as a symbol of what the company really could do, not as a symbol of it's not being able to articulate which way to present its product. It was seen as a tower of strength. This great battleship, this represents what we can really do, fit this. And then a talk of tradition now took on a more honorific rather than pejorative uh, perspective uh, and they, they saw 
it as a, a company that was steeped in tradition and probably therefore was um, one that was responsive to social responsibilities. They picked up the issue of the proportion of disabled people, which interestingly one consultant felt was a very positive thing, and another consultant said, well, would a client really notice that and would a client be interested in that? They then rounded that part of the discussion off by saying, we as consultants will need to go in and analyse this to see if our perceptions of success are the same as, as their perceptions. And Which then... they need a strategy. That's right. Um, and then it shifted completely. It moved into the start of the empathy, the getting into the coats of the workers started with a comment that Roy made. These people have been responsible for innovation. And we need to look at that and see the people behind the innovation. He took on board an enormous amount through empathy. And then, of course, you also took on board how could we help them see this? So because you took the trouble to go back with the empathy bit, you then could get down to the practicalities. Because by slipping into their skins, you've got a greater sense of what will affect change. Not affect it. Affect them to change. That was my committee. You know, congratulations, guys, for making that enormous shift. Because the task was defined differently. Well, just moving that yeah. one step further. Um, when this is all finished, Three weeks. Are you available to us? Are you meaning, will I be hired by the firm or whatever? No, I mean, no. I what I, I what, phone you phone up, that's what people do. And if you're passing, call in. And I'm off in Keithley. <laughs> My letter to you was genuine. And it applies forever, as long as I'm breathing. If you read the letter that I asked Caroline to print off, in my handwriting sent to you. If you now look at the implications, like you're looking at these, I think you probably read whether you A, want to, and B, that you need feel no guilt if you don't want to, because it doesn't stop you being in my luggage. You'll not be ever out of my luggage now any more than all the people I've ever worked alongside. You know, there's luggage family and there's luggage professional, but the thing over the top is the consistency, availability. Are you, are you, are you a religious person? Am I? A religious person. Yes, I'm a very religious person, but I wouldn't say that I'm a church religious person now. But I think consistently, constantly, about how things should be, how life should be. And therefore, there is an energy on which I draw, and I don't know what it looks like, and I don't much care. But I do believe if I miss out on it, <laughs> you know, I'm not much if I can't accept that dimension that is living with mystery. If you will agree to live with mystery, there can be something. You can call it God, you can call it Buddha, you can, you can call it life energy, it doesn't matter. But it means when you, you, you talk with an American Indian, there is a mystery for both of you. But you may give it a different shape. But people choose when they're ready, I suppose. A lot of people find the mystery just when they're about to drop, <laughs> because there isn't much else left. If we're really going to invest in people, and everybody now seems to be on about it, then we're going to have to go the whole hog and really pay attention to how people are and how people function with other people. Because I firmly believe Doris Lessing's statement that the substance of we feeling is one of the most neglected areas in our world. Frequently in teaching, transmission <laughs> teachers want it now in sweeps and they put a plaster on the top and nobody understands any concepts and have made no moves towards understanding anything. Norman knows the only thing I know about is this business 
of luring, protecting, and causing people to be motivated to shift until they didn't realize how far they came in a few hours.